Welcome to hour number two of the Money Man Report. I'm John Rutledge with Danny Babb. We're subbing for Dan Frischberg today. Uh, we would like for you to call in and ask us questions or participate in our discussion. You can call us at 877-777-7713. We have James from Houston on the phone who has a question for us. James. Hey, hey Dr. John. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Doing great. Uh, you know, I've been looking at the numbers, and I, personally, I really believe that inflation uh, is going to be a positive thing, and let me tell you why, and get some feedback from you. As if, if the Fed can keep interest rates low, and um, which, you know, with inflation, that would definitely devalue our currency, since, you know, one of two things ha has to happen with inflation, either interest rates go up or currency is devalued. But as the currency is devalued, Real assets will be appreciated, including including houses. And we're seeing this big housing uh, crisis right now because housing values are so low. Uh, well, in our own little bubble, the dollar bubble, uh, deflating our currency would bring the values of, of that up. Additionally, it would also um, help us be more competitive as far as exports. You know, uh, the dollar, a cheaper dollar, would help companies. Uh, as far as competing with in, you know, inter internationally, and so um, I believe the, the gross national product would, would would drive up. Additionally, even though the real value of stocks uh, wouldn't go up, you know, based on commodities, the stock market would be inflated, and everybody would be happy about that. Now, the one the one problem, the one kink that that you know I guess you see is the Chinese. Well, we'll tell the Chinese come stimulate with us. You know, they wanted to value their currency in relation to the dollar to keep it, you know, stable, uh, kind of sort of pegged to the dollar. They spend money stimulating their economy, devaluating their currency, and pump more money into the U.S. And, and then th why would that not work? Well, actually, I think, James, uh, well, thank you for your question, James. I think that uh, we are going to see rising inflation. It's not rising right now. The most recent numbers are actually very low. They actually show falling prices on both CPI and wholesale price numbers. In fact, uh, uh, if you uh, uh, dial up my blog, which is rutledgeblog.com, there's a story you'll find there called Time to Think About the Next Story, Inflation, Rising Rates, Commodity Prices, and a weak dollar that gives you some of the numbers that uh, uh, behind this. But basically, if the Fed created a, the tsunami of money by increasing bank reserves by 900 percent in six months, every textbook in the world tells you that sometime later on, the price of a loaf of bread is going to be nine times higher than it is today. Now, the Fed is going to be forced to try and reverse their actions because of that pressure sometime in the next year. That's why we'll see the rising rates. But over history, we find that when inflation gets going, it drives people to sell their financial assets, like stocks and bonds, as James said, to buy real estate, commodities, collectibles, and the like. I remember Texas in 1980, 1981, and what the inflation hedging was due to the land values and the, and the ranch land values back then, when you take inflation out, it forces people to move back to securities. Then uh, what, uh, in 1981, when inflation was 15, people kept half their money in hard assets. Today, people keep about 25% of their money in hard assets and the rest in stocks and bonds, which is why we've had this massive boom in the security markets since that time. So inflation, as a short-term story, is, uh, is always talked about as a cure for slow economies. But inflation, is a long-term, is a cancer that eats away at the seed corn that uh, creates the capital that we use to, to grow the place. But I'm worried, along with James, about inflation uh, uh, coming up down the road. And inflation always means higher interest rates, higher interest rates, always mean lower stock market multiples. And I remember when I was working with the Gipper in 1981 uh, with the economic plan, inflation was 15, commercial paper was 22, tax rates were 70, and you could uh, buy the stock market for about six times earnings at that point. The Dow Jones was 860 at that point. So those aren't really days that I want to see uh, come back again. 
but let's uh, let's move on to uh, Danny's uh, is all over the real estate business as, as well as online teaching and, and uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, wh what does all this mean is happening now in the real estate market? Is it starting to break up, or when will the prices firm up a little bit? Yeah, and bet. where would you invest? If you were buying today, well, we've got a question from from Daniel coming in in Houston from Houston on that topic. J James, does that answer your question on inflation? Good, thank okay, you, James. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, James, for your call. Daniel in Houston on real estate. I believe you uh, have some questions similar to what John just asked me. Why don't you uh, go for it? Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Uh, I just have a quick question for you. I, I would be a first-time investor in real estate, and everything is just kind of fluctuating. That you know, it goes up, it goes down. So what I'm wondering is where where do I buy? Mm -hmm. I mean, what what what, what well, would be like the top let's say top five areas to to, to to start investing in now, and then you know keep it for five ten years and sell it off. Well, you know, it really depends on what you want to do with it. Is it something that you want to you know buy and hold? Is it something you want to live in, or do you want to? Uh, is this an investment property? Complete complete investment property. Complete investment property because there's some fantastic areas and and not to you know because this you know obviously Texas based but um, Texas rocks for real estate uh, you guys have not seen the the tremendous drop in the market that the, a lot of other places in the country ha certainly have and I'm holding some long term real estate out in Texas you know if you go to my website thebabgroup.com and you check out uh, real estate publications I have uh, several articles from the last couple of years on the top five places to invest in real estate but let me give you some that I uh, I talked about on Fox Business this last week. The first one is actually Kyleen in Round Rock in Austin, Texas. And uh, I own property out in Round Rock, so full disclosure, but the, um, the market out there has actually been growing, even with the foreclosure rate starting to, to, to go, you know, go up just a little bit. But here's what, what Kyleen in Round Rock offer you. The lowest average price home in any market in the nation while still maintaining quality. That's Kyleen, Texas. Round Rock and Austin have seen incredible job growth and stable home prices despite the downturn nationwide. And jobs are continuing to grow there, which you know is a factor for keeping inventory low and prices stable. And John asked a question about inflation and rates and so on. We are starting to see interest rates on on um, on mortgages actually move up a bit. We're going to talk about after the break, but you know some some other areas that I would look at for pure investment purposes: Mission Viejo, California. Uh, we've seen inc incredible drops there that makes for some great buying opportunities. I love South Florida, despite the the risk there. Um, and I say risk because we don't really know where the bottom's going to be, but if you can get a great deal, I would go for it. Um, I used to have Vegas on my list, not anymore. Uh, we're starting to see just too many job losses out there. But take a look at uh, where boomers are moving to, and that's pretty much the Sunbelt states. So I, I would look at that, and I would look at where jobs are moving to and not leaving from. And uh, I wish you all the luck with your investments. Thanks for calling. And it looks like we lost Daniel, so uh, we will be back after the commercial break. This is Danny and John uh, filling in for Daniel Frischberg. Welcome to Biz Network. Welcome to the Money Man Report. This is Dr. John Rutledge and uh, Danny Babb, Dr. Danny Babb, and we are here to talk with you about your money and about the markets. Uh, we'd like you to call in and ask questions and talk with us about your uh, issues. 877-777-7713. Uh, Danny, the last calls have talked about inflation mm -hmm. and about real estate. Right. And uh, you've talked about where uh, real estate is. Uh, our last caller, though, was a first-time home buyer. What's the deal uh, with the government programs for first-time home loans? And then we'll take a call. Well, you lucky you know what's out there, first-time home buyers, because there are some just amazing deals. You have everything in your in your corner right now in real estate if you're a first-time home buyer. You have incredibly low prices, right? In some areas, 30-year low prices adjusted for inflation. You have incredibly low interest rates, even with the rates up this this week on a 30-year fix to five, about five and a half from five and a quarter last week. Um, you can get an adjustable mortgage still in the high fours, so you have incredible rates. You also have incredible inventory, and you have the FHA willing to loan to you with 3.5% down. Now, here's something that's, that's come up on the table in the last couple of weeks, John, and that is the, um, the $8,000 credit that first-time home buyers are, are eligible to get, or actually a buyer, if you haven't purchased a home in the last three years, is eligible to get. There are, there are, there's, there's legislation now being considered that will allow first-time home buyers to use that $8,000 as part of their down payment. Now that's negotiated with the bank, 
So for example, uh, if you're going to pay the bank 2% of that money, uh, sometimes it's up to 20% of that money, you might only get 6000 of the 8000 but you're still putting $6,000 down ahead of time. So it's not a tax break that you're going to get to look forward to next April. It may very well, by the end of this month, be a credit that you get at the close of escrow, which is an incredible deal for a first-time home buyer. I mean, honestly, I, I love my home, but I wish to God that I was a first-time home buyer in today's market. It's amazing. The key is maintaining your credit score. You know, if you're a first-time home buyer and your home is less than 260,000 in most of the mar most parts of the country, or 762,000 you know, on the two coasts, uh, you can just get an amazing deal right now. So it's time to it's time to start looking. I think buyers are going to start to see them get off the fence, and we've got lots and lots not only foreclosures but desperate sellers out there. Um, negotiate the heck out of a deal. Don't be so tied to a home. You know, unless you're going to stay there for the next 40 years, that you don't get a killer deal because they are certainly out there. So. Very timely because, as we've seen recently, the big government programs to try and uh, put money in the bank's pockets have also decreased credit spreads greatly in the mortgage-backed securities market. So the rates are down, the spreads are down, there's more money beginning to flow again. So this frozen economy is now starting to move forward again. And uh, as Danny said, you have to get those deals while they're there and uh, get that $8,000 of uh, free money. But uh, meanwhile, we have a call. Yeah, Matt, Matt in California, are you there? Yeah, good afternoon, guys out there. Listen, I got a question for you on the government um, getting involved in a lot of the companies with the TARP funds being distributed. Now they're talking about exec limiting executive pay and, and how that's going to affect being able to get talented people to you know run these companies that are in trouble. What are we looking at for well, down the road? And <laughs> that, that's a great question, Matt. <laughs> we could not agree with you more if we discuss this at pretty great length. Um, you know, we, we both blog about it and go to our respective blogs, uh, Dr. Danny Babel, uh, com and uh, RutledgeBlog.com. We have talked about exactly uh, the issue that you're raising. And, you know, when you get the government involved today, FDIC telling City that maybe they uh, – believe it was city that maybe they need to, to change out their executive team. When you start ca capping anybody's pay, you're going to limit talent. Um, Joe, what are your thoughts on this? Oh, that's incredible. You know, I, re I started uh, my life as an economist back during the days when there was a Cold War and we were battling the Soviet Union for dominance. I worked for President Reagan in the White House in 1981 and 82. Uh, what allowed us to essentially crush the Russian economy is that we have a price system and they use central planning to control all their resources. A price system is like a super highway system where information about what's scarce and what's plentiful goes just to the people who need it in the, using prices and all of those private institutions with private managers setting their own prices and their own wages is the reason we're the richest people in the world today every time the government takes over control of some of those prices it shuts down one of those freeways and there's no law of nature that says we have to be the richest people in the world I think this is a very dangerous thing there's also a side effect Matt you know and when the government started buying tons of securities from the banks the bankers responded because they know that selling bales of paper to the government is the most profitable game in town uh, that means they have shut off all other forms of banking. Uh, loans to businesses, private loans, home equity loans, lines of credit, all those have been systematically pruned back since the big programs, and working capital for small businesses has actually gotten more scarce in the last two months. That's why we still have falling jobs numbers. But uh, I think if we can keep the government out of the business of setting wages and prices, we're going to have a lot higher living standards in the future. Amen. Matt, thanks for your call out in California. Uh, we've got Mike in Houston on U.S. dollar and China. Mike, welcome to the program. Hello? Hi, Mike. Welcome to the program. Hi, uh, Dr. Rutledge. Uh, I have a question for you. Dan always refers to you as being an expert on China, and I occasionally invest in some ETFs in uh, Hong Kong. Uh, the, uh, do you think that the long-term outlook for the price parity between, the price peg, I should say, between the Hong Kong dollar and, and the U.S. dollar will continue, or, or some of the, the fluctuation in the dollar may upset that. And kind of a follow-up, the second part, do you think that the relationship, the status quo between the, uh, the relationship between Hong Kong and the uh, Beijing government will remain, or, or there might be something over the horizon that would upset that? 
No, you know, I, I think, Mike, that those are very important questions. I like to get my information about what's happening in these faraway places by actually going there and seeing for myself and talking to people. I was at meetings last month in uh, China with uh, a number of Chinese officials, and it became clear to me that China is actually growing a lot faster than people thought it was, which is one of the reasons we've seen some of those ETFs you talked about really rocket over the last uh, several weeks. And, uh, in, and in particular, I own the Chinese ETF, FXI, and I own the Singapore ETF, EWS. Basically, China gets its money from Hong Kong and Singapore, its raw materials from Indonesia, Australia, and New Zealand, and its technology from Korea, Taiwan, and Japan. You can wrap all those together in an ETF that's ticker is EPP, which is the Pacific X Japan and EWJ for Japan. Regarding the currency, the Chinese have figured out that giving in to American pressure in 2005 and changing the value of their currency was a loser move because it attracted the speculators. They are moving much more toward fixing the rate again, which means that fixed parity with Hong Kong and with the mainland is, I think, going to be a feature of the world we're in for a good long while. And I think China is looking very good right now as an economic bet. Mike, we uh, appreciate your call. Thanks for uh, calling in today. Have a wonderful weekend. And uh, Dr. John Rutledge and myself, Danny Babb, we will be back after the break. Welcome back to Biz Radio Network. This is Dr. Danny Babb and Dr. John Rutledge in for Daniel Frischberg tonight, this, uh, this fine Friday. We look forward to taking your calls here at 877-777-7713. You can contact us both on Twitter, at Danny Babb and at John Rutledge. And you can go to our websites at rutledgecapital.com and drdannybabb.com. And uh, tell us what you're thinking and join our forums and uh, let, you know, we can continue the conversation even after the show. So we look forward to hearing from you. So I, you know, I wanted And sign up for the blogs. They're free. They, yeah, we have lots of free stuff. Lots of free, free stuff, stuff to help people make really solid decisions in this market. You know, and speaking of market, this last, uh, this last segment, we were talking a little bit about real estate. And I think something important is happening out there, actually, that you know, a lot of people might want to be aware of. And that is potential for legislative changes in the appraisal, uh, appraisal arena. Now, why does this matter? For those of you who have tried to get a home loan in the last uh, maybe two years, you may have run into something even in the state of Texas where you don't really have a declining market. You may have run into something called a declining market value. And this is where the bank is going to take anywhere between 5 and 20% off of the appraisal, whether you like it or not, and whether what we used to use, the comps, comparative analysis, support the information or not. So your house may appraise at $300,000, and the bank's going to take $30,000 right off the top of that. So, you know, who comes up with the difference if you want to buy it? That would be you. So what, what's going on in the market, you know, that, that may be affecting this? Well, um, the government has decided that it's in, quote, everyone's best interest to have another middleman in the, in the real estate industry, which could potentially affect what happens in the markets. So, uh, you know, what is, what is this exactly? Well, it was supposed to begin May 1st, and it's been pushed off, looks now, until, July, until around July. It's going to require the nation's 60,000 freelance appraisers and lenders and brokers in the nation to use an appraisal management company. It's called an AMC for short. This is going to prevent lenders and appraisers from actually talking to each other. So today, if you go to get a home loan, your underwriter, the person after you takes your application is the, the loan officer, it goes to underwriting. The underwriting and the loan officer can talk with the appraiser and find out what's going on with that, that particular home. That's not going to happen anymore. Uh, this is going to get better. There are going to be new rules for all players in the game. Uh, people are afraid, you know, they're afraid of the shady characters, appraisals, appraiser, appraisal companies, they were over-inflating appraisals. A lot of them were at the request of the banks. Uh, now they've gone the opposite direction and they're being so cautious that it's really hurting home buyers. So the government has decided that maybe a third party, the AMC, um, which is going to require that the appraiser talks to the AMC and the lender talk to the AMC and they can no longer talk directly to each other, uh, may be the right solution for home buyers out there. Personally, I think that it's going to, um, well, it's going to decrease communication between lenders and appraisers, which has to exist to get any deal done. Uh, it also gives appraisers more power than they've ever had before. You, we have appraisers out there that, quite frankly, are just ticked off because they're, they're going to get paid less. And, in fact, many have emailed me about this. How am I going to make money? I have to now find a second job. This may actually kill deals, particularly in the primer jumbo markets that we've yet to even see the paper come through uh, or the, the foreclosures come through, which I think we'll see next year. 
The government is involved yet again. The Fed housing officials are going to regulate this. Do we need any more government regulation? And yes, added processes. What's that going to mean? That's going to mean less money for the appraiser, but more money for the bank, which is also going to mean more money for the home buyer to shell out to buy a home. So when you buy a house, you know, basically, uh, you're going to be look to, to ha working with an AMC sometime in the next couple of months. And uh, let me ask you all this. Do you think that appraisers are going to work as hard to be as accurate when they're not getting full cash for an appraisal that can take hours and hours to work on? My guess is probably not. What do you think, John? I think it's so nice that now the government looks after us and makes every possible decision for us and saves us from having to process all that information we have to, used to have to think about. So we're now in the nanny state economy where the new administration has decided to make all decisions in Washington so we can just take the rest of the year off. <laughs> hey, that sounds good to me. With pay, of course, that would be fine with me. Uh, you know, we had a caller that uh, they couldn't hold but wanted to list the websites again. I apologize. I, I tend to talk a little fast. So, um, you know, John, you should just smack me around and just tell, Absolutely. Me, tell, tell me to slow down a little well, bit. One of them is thebabgroup.com, where you can find all sorts of good stuff, including a lot of books about uh, different subjects you can buy, and RutledgeCapital.com, where you can uh, read about China and about uh, uh, what I'm up to in places like Tibet and North Korea. Uh, and uh, also you can uh, uh, have a look at the, at the blogs at both of those places where you can uh, subscribe. And uh, uh, also the books, as I, as I said before. Uh, last book for me is called uh, Lessons from a Road Warrior, and it's the the story of how to invest in these crazy uh, gl global markets. And Danny's got, got a book on uh, uh, entrepreneurship and starting businesses, which is what our Saturday show is about. Tomorrow, Saturday, for me, uh, Forbes on Fox, I'll be on, but Danny and I together will do a show from 12 to 2 East Coast time that's called Your Questions, Your Money, which is about starting your own company and dealing with the problems of running a business. We take live call-ins from people on the air, and we have wonderful people that uh, call in to the show, and we hope you can uh, join us there, too. Yeah, and you know, one of the things that we talk about, uh, and I want to get into this after the next break, but you know, why this is the time, perhaps, to start a business. A lot of people think that, you know, with money so tight and it's difficult to get loans, and undoubtedly it is. I mean, who hasn't tried to get a mortgage today and has, you know, quite frankly, uh, gone to bed in tears at night, right? Um, but there is money. You have to know how to get it. That's one of the things we talk about on the show. We'd love to, uh, to help people out here. If you have any questions on starting your business or keeping your business going, feel free to call us, 877-777. 7713. What do you think about uh, different markets, John? Where, where, you, where would you want to invest today? Well, I like to think about investing as, a, as almost a weather map. You know, when, uh, when the government changes a policy or there's another big change in technology in the world, it makes the return on something go up or down compared to other things, and it opens up a big gap in the returns. That gap works exactly like the difference between a high and a low pressure system on a weather map. The gap attracts the investors like the George Soroses to sell the low return and buy the high one, which moves the prices of both of those things. So what we need, uh, what, what I like to do is think about where is that next volcanic action out there or earthquake that's going to make a big gap in the returns. One of them is clearly this new government in Washington that's doing things to change tax rate, raise tax rates, and that's going to be setting up a market in tax shelters here before very long. Another one is the resurgence of growth in Asia, where you can bet on the Asian stock markets. A third one is the inflation story, where the return on commodities and gold and other hard assets has gone up relative to securities. And uh, uh, a fourth one is the technology boom that Danny's talking about. You know, the, the Chinese have spent $600 billion stimulating their economy by actually building communication systems and subways and other things. In America, most of the money for our stimulus program has turned out to be handouts from one person to another and not really building anything, but those, the growth of, that, uh, of those projects in Asia is consuming enormous numbers of microchips and switches and routers and other technology products that are pushing that market up. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we've got lots of investment tips on John's website, so check it out, RutledgeCapital.com. Uh, we look forward to taking your questions. Feel free to give us a call. Uh, and we will be back after the break, Dr. John Rutledge and Dr. Danny Babb in for Daniel Frischberg back in a couple of minutes.
This is the Biz Radio Network. Welcome to the Money Man Report. I'm Dr. John Rutledge. I'm here with the money chick, Dr. Danny Babb. We're subbing today for Dan Frischberg, who's off doing something more uh, in the sunshine, we, uh, we hope. Uh, we'd love you to call us and ask questions. Our phone number is 877-777-7713. You know, John and I do, do a weekend show, two hours every weekend, 12 to 2 on Fox Business, on why this is the time to start a business and how to get your mojo going so that you can start the business that you will never lay yourself off from. Why is today a great time to start a business? First of all, prices are incredibly low. Vendors are desperate. That's a good position to have your vendor in. All growth in the economy is small businesses. Large companies today employ fewer people than they did in 1980. That means if uh, the future of the country is small business, you need to start those businesses so we can get this place growing again. That's our self-bailout. You know, you can negotiate the heck out of pretty much everything. Uh, we've got escalating leases now where you can rent an office, office space and not pay anything for the first couple of years if you sign a five-year lease. People are desperate and that's a great time to start a business there is a ton of talent out there particularly in tech in finance that's been laid off that you can get for for prices quite honestly pretty darn cheap about 20 to 30 percent below what people were making in corporate america and there are ways to hire uh to hire contractors without having to necessarily overhead of employees so you should check out the irs's website be really familiar with what those laws are so you don't get yourself in any trouble and you know we've got we've, we've written an article we have here in the street uh, it's, it's called, How Do I Raise Money for a Business Today? And um, you know, we had Mary write in, How Do I Get Money to Start My Business? Mary wrote us from Arkansas. She wanted to start a small business, uh, a small food business working out of her house. First thing we do is, uh, is talk with people about what they're really trying to do. As Danny said, there are a lot of people out there that own things they wish they didn't and are in financial trouble. Sometimes you can start a business for a lot less money than you think. Today, especially with the Internet available, you can start a business from anywhere without big overhead expenses. And if you need money, you, you have the, the usual resources of friends and family, but the Small Business Administration is now also starting to help people. Yeah, you know, the SBA, people wonder why why are banks not doing SBA loans? I'll, we'll tell you why. There's been about $3 billion of debt sitting on the bank's balance sheets that normally they would have been able to sell to the government. The government, trying to fix the housing mess, stopped buying those loans. They've now uh, promised to spend about $10 billion to take the $3 billion off the balance sheets and inject another $7 billion back into small businesses again, which not only should keep those existing businesses going, uh, but should help some other ones. We also have micro-lending, uh, which is now playing a role, which is basically not a bank, uh, but there are a whole heck of a, lot of, of a lot of them out there. And if you Google micro-lending in your particular area, you can find some specific people to go to to get anywhere between 500 bucks and, and $35,000 generally. The other idea is to be your own bank by looking around your house, your garage, your closet, and finding stuff you've got that you don't need to run your business. You can sell that stuff on eBay or on Craigslist or other ways and use that cash instead of borrow money from other people. That way you don't have to pay the money back later. Yeah, you know, and a lot of people ask us all, well, actually we get asked maybe 50, 100 times a week, should I use the, the home equity in my in my house if I actually have some? Should I use a credit card to start a business? Yeah, it depends. If you're passionate about that business, you're going to find the money. And, you know, some people, layoffs, I'll tell you, that was the best thing that could have happened to me because it got me off of uh, the corporate America relying on them for most of the day job. Uh, and realizing that my own business would actually work, and sometimes you can hold both going, you know, hold both down. You're given four months, say, given four months before you're going to get laid off, and you want to start your business. Why not do it while you're still in corporate America? And uh, maybe you can even get your boss behind you and get some clients out of it. So there's certainly nothing wrong with taking equity out of your home if you still have it. Uh, rates for that are a little higher today. You're looking generally between seven and eight percent for a home equity line. They're a little harder to get, uh, so you're going to want to do that while you are still employed by, with corporate America, if possible. Yeah, you know, one of the other questions that we get, uh, John, is about whether or not family and friends should be involved. What's your take on that? Well, I think that's uh, that can be a landmine. Uh, you can uh, you can borrow money from people that later on result in hurt feelings. So it's a dangerous thing to do. But on the other hand, those are people who also believe in you and sometimes just want to be of help. So I'd be very careful. I'd want to make sure that they can afford it. I'd want to make sure that if it goes wrong and they don't get paid back, it doesn't hurt you. But if you're careful, sometimes you can get a business started with friends and family helping. 
Yeah, and then of course the follow-up question to that is how, what kind of, uh, of, of um, role are they going to have in the business afterwards? We've had different experience with that. Mine has not been so great, so I tend to not bring my family into my businesses. But, you know, it just depends on the family and, and how well you can carve off pieces of that and how well defined if you can separate business from personal. That's really a personal decision. You know, and, and you don't have to go all out and don't spend your, if you have five grand to start a business, you can do, you can start a business on five grand. You don't want to go blow it on office chairs and stationery. You want to put it where it matters. If people believe that venture capitalists, for example, are the answer, the truth is that less than 1% of businesses actually get funded uh, from funding from venture capitalists. And our last plug for small business owners, 80% of the money the Treasury collects at the top tax rate comes from the owners of small businesses in America. When you hear these guys in Washington talk about taking money away from the rich guys and the millionaires and uh, giving it to someone else, they're really talking about taking it away from the small businesses that create all of the jobs that grow the economy. I'm not very happy about what I see happening with tax policy in Washington. Some pushback from people could help that. And those tax the policies also have a lot to do with what kinds of investments uh, that you own. Along with uh, managing a small business, you also have to manage your working capital, your 401k, your IRA account, and other assets. And uh, right now, all these markets on the securities are on a tear with uh, firming up stock prices uh, uh, left and right. And I think uh, uh, investing today is uh, is something that's a little bit easier than it was a year ago. Yeah, you know, and John's talked for the last couple of hours now about uh, about the demand from other countries, and that is yet another reason to actually start a business, particularly an online business. The world is truly global. For less than five grand, you can put up an e-commerce site. If you've got something a specific niche, maybe we had a toy maker call in last weekend, uh, a person who knew a heck of a lot about toys and wanted to know how to how to get all this information out on the internet. So first you start blogging about it and you become the known expert and you post in forums and you do all the things that make you the expert with your signature block, having the name of your website, and you get out there for less than five grand, you can hire a web designer, you want to choose something that's template or plug-in components, uh, you know, where you're not paying a lot basically to add, to add functionality to your website, you're probably looking for initial e-commerce sites between two and three grand. Uh, plugins between 10 and 30 bucks each, sometimes they're free. Get out there, get on Twitter, get on blogs, get on Facebook, get on forums. Make it very easy for people to buy so they're not having to hunt around, you know, for what they look for, what to look for. Um, don't delete candid feedback from visitors, but, you know, you can also integrate merchant accounts, right, from a bank, uh, drive up, which can drive startup costs up, but it can also really increase the number of people that can buy from you, particularly those overseas. So and there's a ton of options out there. And remember, starting and running a business of your own and managing your money really take the same information and the same uh, energy. Uh, we're glad we got a chance to talk with you today for two hours. And thanks to Dan Frischberg for inviting us in to sub for him. And uh, we will look forward to be a being able to do this again, take more questions, and talk more about the, the best ways of, uh, of making your wealth grow. Yeah, and you can reach us on the web at thebabgroup.com and rutledgecapital.com. And feel free to continue the conversation on thebabgroup.com's website. We have a chat system there. Anybody listening wants to ask each other questions, feel free. Uh, we hope that you have a terrific weekend. and. Uh, Enjoy the rest of your Friday. Absolutely. And thank you for listening to the Money Man Report. Money Man Report. With Dr. Danny Babb and Dr. John Rutledge on Friday afternoon.